Hey guys, we are looking today at chapter seven, which is all about the skeletal system, uh, mostly the bone structure and its function. Our objectives mostly come from this chapter, um, but in lab, you will go over the things that are in chapter eight as you're looking at the different types of bones and where they are, the axial and appendicular skeleton, a lot more in depth. So while the notes are coming from chapter seven, there are some concepts in chapter eight as well. Um, and then of course, for your lab work, chapter eight may be helpful as you're trying to um, place the bones in certain areas and name them by their structure. So just know that. Um, but let's start with the different uh, parts and pieces we need first from our chapter seven. So here's our objectives. Again, that first one, explain bones, cartilage, ligaments, um, and classification. That's also a little bit in chapter eight. Um, explain bones and cartilage formation. That's all in here um, and how to report. Uh, bones fractures are repaired all in here. Um, the causes of dwarfism in here. Um, the endocrine regulation um, of calcium, that's here. Um, osteoporosis, also here. Um, but number four, identifying the axial bones and bone markings, um, as well as the appendicular bone and bone markings. Well, we're going to talk about that as sort of an overview, that's more of the objectives you'll get in lab. So the way it's sort of set up is that uh, the department expects you to, to learn that more in your lab course, but they can ask questions um, in lecture, even though we don't super like go over it in the same capacity of lab. That being said, I will give you the info you need here, so don't panic. So let's start with the functions of the skeletal system. The skeletal system has four main parts that make it up. Of course, that's going to be the bones. That's the organ of the skeletal system. The cartilage, um, and that is normally found sort of at the tops and bottoms or the ends of the bones in between bones. Um, then we've got tendons and ligaments connecting the bones either to other bones or to other structures like muscle. What are bones? Well, bones are the organs of the skeletal system, and we know that they're connective tissue um, when we looked at connective tissue types, um, but they also contain nerve tissue and vascular tissue. What is the main purpose of bones? Well, first, we know that they are the support or the framework that supports the rest of the body, as well as to uh, sort of cradle the soft organs. Think like your lungs and your heart are being held in um, by your rib cage, for example. We know that they are protection, so they are going to provide this protective case for organs like your brain and spinal cord, also things like your rib cage or your pelvis holding um, and providing protection for other vital organs. They are a source of uh, movement, so they act like levers, and there are different classes of levers. Um, we'll talk about that sort of very briefly. Your book goes into it in much more depth, but these levers are, uh, or they act as levers for muscles to work upon. Their storage, so they're going to be this extra place reservoir for minerals like calcium and phosphorus. And they're responsible for blood cell production. So a process that we call hemipoesis is going to happen in the cavity of the bone, specifically with the bone marrow. Let's first talk about cartilage. I know we talked about it a little bit, um, and you did in lab as well when you talked about connective tissue types. But let's go dive in a little more. Um, we've got our chondroblasts, which produce cartilage, and those chondroblasts are going to become chondrocytes. Chondrocytes are located in lacunae, surrounded by the matrix. 
And I like to think of that lacune as sort of like almost like a little hammock where the cell is going to be hanging out and it's surrounding the cell. Maybe that's not a great analogy, but it's the only one that works for my brain. We also have the matrix of the cartilage, and that's going to be where we have our different protein fibers uh, for strength. And then we have something called proteoglycans, which help to hold on to water. We've got what we call the perichondrium, which is going to surround the cartilage. The outer layer of that has the fibroblasts, and the inner layer has the chondroblasts. And then cartilage is going to grow by apositional and interstitial growth, which we're going to go over um, very shortly. But that is just whether it is growing um, sort of like width wise um, or length wise. Um, but again, we'll go over that in just a moment. So here is a figure from your book uh, showing you that um, cartilage, what it would look like under the microscope. So here's your perichondrium, that outer layer of um, that is growth or that has grown and is sort of like the connecting, encompassing piece. We've got our chondroblasts making uh, that will become chondrocytes, the, the cells. This lacunae, right, that's that little outside capsule holding on to it. Um, you can see the nucleus of the cells in our um, cartilage. And then we do have here um, showing you that there's these chondrocytes that have divided. So there is this um, growth that's taking place. And then, of course, the matrix is all of this fibrous spaced out network as well. So you've got this apositional growth, that's the new cartilage added to the surface um, and sort of pushing outwards. And then the interstitial growth that is formed when the chondrocytes divide and make more matrix as well. So sort of a length growing. And that's really all we care about for cartilage. Um, there is more in your book if you want to get more in depth, but let's talk about bones. So we'll start with the histology and we'll start with um, bone matrix. That is mostly uh, inorganic material. So about 65% inorganic, 35% organic. What is the organic material? Well, there'll be collagen that is providing strength that is still sort of movable and flexible. Um, and then we've got that proteoglycans, which is uh, going to be helping to keep water, trap water. Um, the inorganic piece is something that we call hydroxyapatite. Sorry, hydroxyapatite, um, or just calcium and phosphorus crystals. That is going to provide the weight bearing strength. So it's what is the, the hard strength for our bones. There can be um, changes in that bone matrix and then this is sort of what will happen. So if you do not have that um, phosphorus, calcium, hydroxyapatite, um, then you're going to get this bone that could like bend and move because you still have that collagen material. Um, and, and this would not be good though. Like we don't want a bone to do that. If we didn't have the collagen, then it would make it a very brittle bone and it would shatter. So we need both of these um, strengths. We need the hard strength from the minerals. We need the flexible strength from the collagen in order for our bones to function. And you can sort of think of it like concrete and rebarb, um, right? You need concrete um, to, you know, build a sidewalk or a building. And the rebarb is in there as extra added strength, um, like tensile strength. So you need both things. Um, like in a building, if you didn't have the rebarb, the concrete would crumble. If you don't have the concrete, well, then you 
don't really have a structure. So same thing with bone, you need both things. Okay, let's go into individual cells. Uh, so we've got osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are producing bone matrix and they become the osteocytes. Osteoblasts connect to each other and they have these little cell processes or like little fingers that reach out um, and they are going to surround themselves with bone matrix to become the osteocytes. Osteocytes also have a lacunae or that little capsule or little hammock they sit in uh, and they are connected to each other through something called caniculi and those are like little I don't know, tubes almost. I don't really want to call them that, but they're little connecting canals. Um, osteoclasts are the um, things that break down bone. So there are instances when you want to break down bone. You have osteoclasts. Osteoblasts come from a very special kind of cell that we call an osteochondral progenitor cell. And that's a really fancy word for something that is a bone and cartilage stem cell. That is where we're going to make our osteoblasts or our chondroblasts that will then make osteocytes or chondrocytes. And we find that these osteoclasts are going to be originating in the red bone marrow. So the um, in your bones, there's red bone marrow, and that is where we are getting these cells from. So what does that process look like? Um, well, first we call it ossification. You'll also see it being called osteogenesis. So you can think like genesis, like creating, um, but you'll also see in your book ossification. So I give you both words. Um, but step one is that osteoblasts on a surface like cartilage or other bone um, exist. And then their little pro processes or projections sort of reach out. And that's what you can see here. And they connect. And so now they've joined together. Then we have these osteoblasts making this new bone matrix. That's just not bone cell, it's the stuff around it. Um, and now those osteoblasts have become an osteocyte because they now have this matrix around them. And uh, this is a nice picture from your book, but here's sort of what that looks like uh, under a microscope, right? It's not as cute and color coded, um, but you've got these cells, they reach out to each other, they connect. Now they're all this like woven Mat or woven network and they can make their matrix. So when we are looking at this bone tissue that we've just made, we have to classify it as woven or lamellar. And we do that based on what their collagen fibers look like. So if you're a woven bone, you have collagen fibers that are oriented in all different directions. Think of it just like a woven basket. It's all different ways. Um, and it can be remodeled to form this lamellar bone. Lamellar bone is the mature bone. That's what you see in, you know, a skeleton. It has these layers that are arranged that we call lamellae. And the collagen fibers are parallel to each other. So they're not crisscrossed like a woven basket. They're in an order. When we look at a bone, we want to classify it according to that matrix and how much of it there is within the bone. So we can have bone that has a lot of spaces. We'll call that cancellous bone. This internal layer is more like a honeycomb, and we call it a uh, trabeculae. There's a lot of vocab words. I already should have warned you, but there are a lot of new vocab words. Um, and that little honeycomb structure, that is going to be where we have the bone marrow. It can be red bone marrow, um, or as you age, it can be yellow bone marrow. 
Um, and that is what we're sort of seeing here, this like spongy looking structure um, is that spongy bone or that cancellous bone. Then you've got compact bone, which is very dense and it doesn't have the spaces. It's not filled with the marrow. It has a very dense matrix. Um, and that is what we're seeing on the top and bottom here. Um, and that is when you look at a bone and think of a bone, that's probably the type of bone that you are imagining. It's that compact bone. So when we're talking about this more spongy shaped bone, the can cancellous bone, we've got this lamellae and that combine in order to form what we call that trabiculae. So really that's a lot of vocab to just say that these little beams of bone interconnect and make this lattice spongy like structure and inside of that we have bone marrow and we have blood vessels. And we can look at these trabiculae individually and we see that they're orientated along lines of stress and the reason that they're that way is that they're going to provide strength. And I know that seems counterintuitive because you've got all of this space and these canals and this look to it, um, but sort of think of like a tree ring um, growing outwards um, and those rings being shaped the way they are. It's, it's an awful lot like this where that is providing order and providing structure, which does provide strength. And you can get way more in depth of that if you really want to. Um, there are some videos that are on the D2L for you. Um, but if you just want the very surface level, just know that this network is oriented to provide structural strength and then you're good. Okay, let's, let's dive now into this compact bone where we have these very organized lamellae and we can categorize that lamellae um, in a couple different ways. First, we could have circumferential lamellae, which is the outer surface of the compact bone. Think of the word circumference, right? That's the outside of the circle. Um, same, the same thing. Uh, then you could have concentric lamellae, which is going to be um, surrounded by central canals uh, or the, surround the central canals and they form what we call an osteon. An osteon is this grouping um, for structure again in our compact bone and you'll see a picture shortly. Then you can have what we call interstitial lamellae which are really just the leftover parts when that bone has done its remodeling. So when it, it is turning into this compact bone, um, there'll be this interstitial lamellae kind of left behind. Okay, so we have these canals that are in the compact bone as a way to exchange gas, nutrients, and waste products. So when you think of a bone, you probably think of this hard structure and because you see skeletons, you think of it as like dead. I know that is a misconception I had. If you don't have that misconception, cool. But if you do, um, it's time to switch that for you and realize that those canals are there because your bone is living. You have living cells that need things like oxygen and nutrients and need to get rid of waste. Um, so we, we have those canals in the bone to do that for the cells. Um, when we look at it from the periosteum uh, to the endosteum, we've got what we call perforating canals and perforating canals carry blood vessels and they bring those to the central canal. Um, and then you've got the caniculi, which are going from those central canals to those individual cells. So here's what we've got that looking like. So you've got a bone 
And let's just look at this compact bone and make it really big. Um, you've got blood vessels and arteries and things that need to move things in or out um, from the individual cells. So you will see those um, here as your uh, herversion or central canals. Again, a lot of vocab, a lot of vocab words. Um, so these are your central canals. Okay. You'll also see that those canals or those blood vessels need to connect to each other. Those are our perforating canals going sort of sideways. When we have this central canal, all of this stuff that's arranging around it um, in a nice orderly pattern, we call that that osteon. Okay, the osteon is going to have the osteocytes and their matrix nicely ordered around that central canal. Um, and then, of course, the other word we talked about was the periosteum. That's the outside tissue layer um, on our bone. So that is represented here, having more of those blood vessels um, to, to get nutrients and waste in and out of the bone. And what does this all look like under a microscope? I'm so glad you asked. It looks like this. So you've got this central canal. That's the big sort of dark opening spot here. That's where you're having these vessels to move things in and out. You have this nice pattern going here. Um, those are going to be your um, lamellae containing your osteocytes in their lacunae. And we can see like at the very edge of it, um, like here even at the very edge, that would be considered that cir circumference lamellae, but you can see these concentric lamellae here, they go in a nice orderly fashion. Um, and then you're having these caniculi, um, little tiny canal passageways to bring things to cells. Hopefully that all made sense. I feel like I'm a little rambly here. So sorry. Um, haven't had enough coffee yet today. Um, but there is videos or there are videos and there is a lot of good information in your textbook as well and on the McGraw-Hill um, Connect Plus site. So if you need more, please spend some time with this diagram um, or other diagrams to get that down. It is a, just a lot of vocabulary that is new describing these features and vocabulary that is redundant. So things like Haversion Canal and Central Canal are the same thing. It's just two words to mean the exact same thing, which, you know, makes things clear as mud, I, I know. Okay, so now that we've got the basics of the tissue mostly down, let's look at the anatomy of the bone. And this again is a place where chapter eight will kind of come in and a place where your lab will really help as well. So we've got individual bones being classified by their shape. That's our first way that we are going to classify whole bone structure. So we can have long bones, very simple. They are longer than they are wide. Think of most of the bones that you find like in your arms and your legs. They are longer than they are wide. Then we've got short bones, which is about as wide as they are long. So they are sort of cubey shaped or I don't know, brick shaped in that they are wide as they are long. Those are going to be the bones that you find in your wrists and your ankles. So we call them your carpals and your tarsals. Then you've got flat bones. Flat bones are relatively thin. They have a flattened shape uh, and they do have a curve to them usually. This is going to be bones that you find in your skull, your ribs, your sternum, also called your breastbone, um, and your shoulder blades. They are flattened, squished, um, and, and they do have a slight curve to them. 
And if you are not a long bone, a short bone, or a flat bone, then you're going to be an irregular bone. Those do not fit in the other categories. They're the oddballs. Uh, things like your vertebrae, many of your facial bones, and your pelvic girdle are all considered irregular bones. Okay, let's look at the structure of the long bone first because we will um, sort of break down the different kinds of bones at what we're doing as we go through here. So a long bone has a diaphysis and an epiphysis. Again, new vocab. The diaphysis, this is the tubular shaft that forms the axis of the long bones. It is going to be made of compact bone and it's going to surround the medullary cavity. Yellow bone marrow or fat is going to be inside of that medullary cavity. It's not to the same extent, but some bones can also have red bone marrow stored in that cavity. We also have our epiphysis that is going to be the ends that have expanded on our long bones. It is exterior to the compact bone and is interior um, and the interior of spongy bone. So the outside part compact, inside part spongy. We've got a joint surface being covered with articular cartilage, also called hyaline cartilage, which we will talk about more in our next lecture when we specifically talk about joints. You've got what we call an epiphyseal line. That is going to separate your diaphysis from your epiphysis. And you've got what we call an epiphyseal plate. That is the site of growth in length. And that plate will become the line. And when um, all of the cartilage is replaced by bone. So your epiphyseal plate, if you've ever heard of growth plate, that is what you are actually talking about. Um, and don't worry, there will be a picture very shortly to point exactly what we've just talked about vocab words wise out to you, but it makes more sense when you've got all the words. Then there are membranes um, with our bones. So you've got <clears throat> the periosteum, which is this double layer uh, protective covering on the outside surface. It's fibrous. It has dense, regular connective tissue. It also has the blood vessels and the nerves in it. Then you've got this inner uh, layer as well that has osteoblasts, osteoclasts, and the osteochondral protogenitor cells. Then you've got something called an endostem, which is this very delicate membrane that is on the inside surface of the bone. And that's where you also have osteoblasts, osteoclasts, and osteochondral progenitor cells. So all of those words there. Let's first just take a chunk of bone and give it a look. On the outside here, that's where you've got your articular or hyaline cartilage. That's where we're going to have joints. Remember that for next chapter, but that's it. When you look then right underneath where that cartilage is, and both of these you can sort of see are the same here. Um, this is just the younger bone and then the adult bone. Um, then you've got that epiphysis, okay, epiphysis. And here's where you've got that epiphyseal plate in the young bone or that growth plate, okay. And then you've, of course, got your hardened bone, and then inside you're going to have that medullary cavity, which is where you will find um, that bone marrow. And this long shaft part, that's your diaphysis. As you age, right, that growth plate, that cartilage that is there will turn into bone and we will have those epiphyseal lines. And um, of course, where all of this spongy bone was in young bone, and this medullary cavity that we had in the young bone, 
we'll see that we've turned a lot of this space into that hard um, bone or that um, cancellous bone. And um, we've got, of course, compact bone on the outside. And then we've got this shaft that is our diaphysis. And we've got our medullary cavity now, but with yellow bone marrow. So any of you that are interested in like forensic science stuff, if there were to be a body found, one of the ways that they can age a body is by looking at this epiphyseal plate. Is it um, still cartilage? So it was a young person. Is it the epiphyseal line? The growth is, is done. Um, they can look at, do we have this cancellous bone, this more like spongy canals, or do we have the um, cancellous bone that is definitely more hardened, um, smaller canals? Um, they can look at the compact bone um, and as well as what is in this medullary cavity. Is it red bone marrow? Is it yellow bone marrow? And when they're looking at that, there are certain percentages and, you know, measurements that they can look at to determine a rough age estimate um, of the bones that were, were found. Um, if we were to then sort of take this middle shaft area and look at it, um, you would see, of course, this periosteum layer where we've got our blood vessels, our nerves, all of that. You've got your compact bone um, with, you know, very little space within the matrix. You've got this cancellous bone with that trabeculae that's providing that, uh, you know, flexible strength. And then, of course, um, this inner, inner part is going to be where you would find that medullary cavity where you could have bone marrow. Okay, a little bit more on some of this anatomy here. Um, when you've got flat, short, and irregular bones, um, it does look a little bit different than that long bone anatomy. Flat bones have that interior framework of that cancellous bone sandwiched between two layers of compact bone. And then short and irregular bones also have a composition similar to the ends of the long bones. So they're not really the place where we're finding this medullary cavity. Um, it's more of this kind of structure here. Um, and you do not need to really look at any pictures in particular or, you know, graph it out in any way, um, but just knowing that it is different than your long bones. Okay, so we saw that there is that epiphyseal plate or the growth plate. Um, when do we get bones in our human body? Um, and what is that all about? Well, we begin to develop around eight weeks of embryo development. We have what we call intermembranous ossification, where bones develop from this fibrous membrane. And that really happens in skull bones, parts of the mandible and uh, the diaphysis of your clavicles. Then we've got endochondrical um, ossification where the bone forms by replacing hyaline cartilage. And bones at the base of the skull, the other parts of your mandible, um, the epiphysis of the clavicle, and pretty much the rest of the skeletal system happen this way. So what is this about? Let's start with intramembranous ossification. So within the membrane at the centers of ossification, osteoblasts start to make bone and they make it along the membrane fibers and then they connect and then they ossify. Beneath the periosteum, the uh, osteoblasts lay down compact bone, that is the outer surface, and then we have something called fontanelles. That's the area of the membrane that do not ossify at birth. Fontanelles are those soft spots, if you will. And the reason those exist is a baby has a rather large head and we still need a little bit of that squishiness for 
the head to be able to leave the birth canal. So here's what we got going on. Um, we've got this membrane and we're starting to grow these um, osteoblasts out, but we've got these soft spots um, still that will later harden. Um, and then we can see that the ones that are yellow, so the frontal bone, parietal bone, some parts of your jaw um, and face bones, those are going to be formed by this intermembranous ossification. Then we have the endochondral ossification that's in blue, um, which we'll get to shortly. Um, so here's really a cross section of what that looks like. Um, you've got first this very young bone um, here where we've got these osteoblasts that will then make osteocytes and we've got that matrix happening. And this is sort of where we're starting and then we, when we zoom out of that magnification, you can see that we're forming this very interconnected network. Um, that will eventually become the hard bones that you know are in your skull. Um, and here's what it would look like in sort of an x-ray vision of that. Um, so you can see parts where we've already gotten the hardened bone and like where we're still growing it. Um, and you can see these soft spots here as well, or fontanelles. Um, and then interesting, it shows you some of these other bones here where it's still just cartilage. Like this will be, you know, your carpals, um, but that is going to be our endochondral bo bone formation that we're going to talk about as well. So endochondral ossification, that is just hyaline cartilage is there and it's modeling the bone and then it is replaced um, by bone tissue. So we have to break down the hyaline cartilage and then we will build up bone. And we've got the perichondrium covering the hyaline cartilage and it has blood vessels and nerves and, and everything there. And it is going to be converting uh, this perichondrium into the paraosteum. And we will have basically a change in the nutrition, like what is coming to that area that will turn those osteochondral progenitor cells into osteoblasts. First, we get what we call a bone collar, which is around the diaphysis of the hyaline cartilage model, and then we can build the rest of the bone. Um, blood vessels will grow into this calcified cartilage, bringing osteoblasts, osteoclasts from the periosteum. And then the primary ossification center, that's a place where you get osteoblasts to first lay down the bone matrix. You'll get your medullary cavity. And then you'll get secondary centers um, in the epiphysis. And then basically you're just laying down bone with the hyaline cartilage only at the epiphyseal plates um, or where we would call those the growth plates. So here's what that looks like. You've got a bone model that is totally cartilage. It has this perichondrium. You're getting blood vessels and nerves and things growing there that are going to bring in the things we need uh, to get to our primary ossification, which then can then lead um, you know, outwards to secondary ossification, but we'll start with the primary here. Um, we're laying down this uh, calcium to calcify the cartilage, then which we can then build bone onto. So here's our bone collar, our little placeholder in which we can then build bone matrix, which we see here. Um, and then we've, of course, have the secondary sites where we have this calcium cartilage um, where they can also build bone. Um, and then we're just left with this um, line of cartilage, which will be our epiphyseal plate. Okay. So, yep, here's exactly that. This is left over. 
as our epiphyseal uh, plate. And we've got our secondary sites growing <clears throat> bone as well. And then eventually, you know, we end up with this line right here, um, where as you age, that will turn into bone. So that's what we're seeing there. Um, and we leave the articular cartilage on the outside of the bone. Okay, bone increase in size with apositional growth, which means that you're adding um, to the bone on the surface of older uh, bone or cartilage. And your trabeculae also grow in that apositional growth. So they're sort of pushing out, um, growing on top of a matrix that's already established. Um, we're going to do that at the epiphyseal plate. Okay, so we're going to have the interstitial growth of cartilage, and then we'll have the apositional growth on the cartilage. So epiphyseal plate growth is going to increase the length of the diaphysis and any bony processes on the bone. And then bone length ceases when the epiphyseal plate is ossified and we get the epiphyseal line. And again, this is, you know, one of the ways when a doctor, you know, says like, oh yeah, you're going to be about, you know, six foot tall. It's, they can look at these uh, epiphyseal plates and, and make an estimate um, based on that of how much growth you still have left um, for your long bones. Okay, um, really we, we have that growth happening, we said, right, the ossification, but this is more after birth, you know, like into um, childhood and, and then ending at adulthood. Um, but you've got that epiphyseal plate in four zones. You've got resting cartilage, and that's cartilage that attaches to the epiphysis. You've got the zone of proliferation. That is new cartilage is produced on the epiphyseal side. And um, basically the chondrocytes divide and it's a stack. You've got a zone of um, hypertrophy where the chondrocytes maternal large. And then you've got a zone of calcification where you're calcifying it. The chondrocytes are gonna die and we're gonna be replaced um, with bone. And then of course, ossified bone, the calcia, uh, calcified cartilage at the diaphyseal side of the plate is replaced by bone. So what that ends up looking like here is uh, if we took this little epiphyseal plate and blew it up really big, your epiphyseal side, that is the side that has that cartilage that is resting, this proliferation where we're producing new, uh, this hypertrophy where they're mature, and then this bottom side where they are ossifying and becoming bone. So here is that process as to how you get length. So you've got your epiphyseal plate, you've got bone, um, and we're really just building and stacking, which is pushing up this upper layer, um, which then means we can grow and calcify our bone, and we still have our thickness of our epiphyseal plate being the same. It's, it's unchanged. So we also have that articular cartilage. It is what is at the end of the bones for our joints. And it's involved in the interstitial growth of cartilage followed by a positional growth of bone. What that means is that you get these uh, epiphyses that increase, um, but the size of the bones uh, that don't have this epiphyseal plate. So you're getting a larger top structure, um, but not changing that epiphyseal plate. 
So bone growth and width, that's that apositional growth, and that's happening under the periosteum. And basically you're just laying down uh, this bone tissue to increase the width or the diameter of the bones. So the osteoblasts that are in the periosteum make these ridges with grooves. The ridges will grow together. Those grooves and ridges are going to be the tunnels that get filled with the lamellae. And that is what forms the osteons. We know that nice ringed little pattern. Um, and then osteoblasts that are in that periosteum are going to make that uh, circumferential lamellae which we can remodel, we can redo. Okay, what affects your bone growth? Well, you've got genetic factors that determine the size and shape. And this can be um, an expression of genetic factors that can be modified. So you can have um, either like a tolerance or a deficiency in vitamin D, um, which would then affect how it is mineralizing and making the matrix. Hormones like growth hormone, estrogen, and testosterone actually stimulate bone growth. Um, and then estrogen and testosterone cause the closure of that epiphyseal plate. So that's like why you are get your growth spurts at puberty and then, um, you know, you stop growing. And then um, at the end, we'll look a little bit more at dwarfism and what that bone growth is about and, and how that works. Um, but just know that there are factors that can affect it. Okay, remodeling. We've said that word a few times already. What does that mean? Well, we're taking this woven bone and we are converting it or remodeling it into lamellar bone. And that is going to let a bone change shape, adjust to stresses, repair itself, as well as regulate the calcium levels. So we've got something called a BMU, that's a basic multicellular unit that is able to make tunnels and bones, which then get filled with lamellae and form osteons. Our BMU is a temporary assembly of osteoclasts and osteoblasts. And really these BMUs are actively working. So about every 10 years, you have an entirely new skeleton. The interstitial lamellae that we talked about, the sort of leftover parts and pieces, um, that is the remnants of bone not removed by these BMUs. And here's sort of what that looks like. So in a growing bone, you've got this medullary cavity, you've got it growing in diameter, you've got that growth in diameter happening from adding bone, reabsorbing this inside bone, um, cartilage is getting replaced by bone at this epiphyseal line here. Um, so, so that's happening here. And we're getting all of that growth and it, and it ends like this. We've got an epiphyseal line. We're no longer having growth there. You've got your medullary cavity. You've got all of this um, sort of spongy looking trabeculae there providing structural support and strength, and you've got articular cartilage. Okay, so that is one process of remodeling in a bone. The other is if the bone is broken, it can fix itself. And we call these broken bones fractures. And a bone fracture is classified by the position of the bone ends after the fracture, the completeness of the break, the orientation of the bone to that long axis and whether or not it goes through the skin. And I will warn you now, there are some really awesome pictures coming up. So if you're a little bit squeamish, they're coming. Uh, open fracture, that is where bone fragments actually puncture through the skin. Closed fracture, they do not go through the skin. So the top one, that is the open fracture. Closed fracture is the bottom. 
the open and closed do not necessarily determine like how bad the fracture is. It is just if it is through the skin or not through the skin. You can have something called a POTS fracture that is going to occur at the ankle and affect both the tibia and the fibula. Um, and that can be like if someone jumps and lands on both of their feet um, at the ankle causing that break. Then you have the uh, com comminuted fracture um, or, or shattering the bone. So you can see here a bunch of different pieces shattered. You can have a green stick fracture where the bone breaks incompletely. And you can think of it like a green twig. Uh, if you try to break it, it doesn't really break all the way. And that is here. It's, it's broken, but it's not like all the way through. You can have a spiral fracture where you have this ragged break when you get a twisting force. So it is sort of like in a spiral shape. You can have a compression where you crush the bone. You can have a depressed fracture where it's broken and a portion pushes inward. Um, this can be on any bone, but you'll see depressed, um, like mostly talked about like for skull fractures. Um, and then you can have an impacted where the broken bone ends are forced into each other. Um, so that's like this, where you jammed them into one another. Okay, so here's some pictures of what's gonna happen before we talk about it. Um, but obviously bones can repair themselves, right? People, animals break bones, they still survive through it. Um, how does that happen? Well, first, you're going to get what's called a hematoma, which is like this blood-filled bubble or blister rushing to the site. Um, and that's because you have all these damaged vessels from the break. Then you're going to make a callus, um, which is going to be this network of sort of woven bone and cartilage that is... Um, going to be there to sort of push out to replace the dead bone. Then that callus is going to ossify and then you've got, um, you know, a, a healed fracture and then we remodel it um, where we're, you know, going to turn it into that, um, that um, hard, um, uh, cow's bone instead of the woven bone. So let's look at that step by step. Step one, hematoma forms. We've got torn blood vessels that are hemorrhaging or losing blood. So we've got that blood sort of rushing to the site. Um, it's really going to be this mass of clotted blood that is going to form at the fracture. And you'll, if you've ever broken a bone, you know that this happens. Like, I mean, I can feel it in bones that I've broken right now, even though it's like imaginary, but you, you get this swollen, painful, inflamed, um, bruised looking area where the bone has been broken. Then you get this callus. Um, that's where we get this callus tissue, the soft tissue, forming a few days after the fracture. You get capillaries growing back in, You've got um, phagocytic cells that are there to get rid of the dead bone. You've got this little matrix of woven bone starting and cartilage starting. Um, and that's the first step in the healing process. Um, once you've got that callus, the osteoblasts and fibroblasts are going to go there um, and they're going to start reconstructing the bone. Fibroblasts are going to make collagen fibers and connect broken bone ends. Osteoblasts are going to start making the woven bone. And then osteoblasts will also get capillaries to secrete. Um, and you've got basically making more, more capillaries. Um, and this matrix that will eventually calcify. 
Okay, now we want to calcify it. The fibers and the cartilage that are inside, um, as well as the outside calluses, turn into bone, woven bone. Um, and we eventually want it to all be that cancellous bone, um, but we start with woven bone and some cancellous bone. This takes about four to six weeks after the injury. Um, it's also why if you've broken a bone and you, you know, get your cast off, they still tell you, you know, to be a little bit careful because it's not totally completely healed until that remodeling is done. So um, that takes some time. That remodeling is any extra material on the bone shaft um, is removed and the compact bone is laid down and we reconstruct the walls. And that can take more than a year to complete. Um, and then once it's done though, your bone is good as it was. Um, it's, it's, you know, back to normal. Um, but up until that point, it is still in this woven bone stage. So again, that's why they tell you to take it easy so that you don't re-break um, the structures. Again, here is our picture kind of showing you that whole process. Um, and there is much more in your book as well as on the D2L. So feel free um, to, to spend some time on it if this is something that interests you. Okay, calcium and maintaining calcium in your body. That's important and your bone uh, bones play a major role in that. Bones, of course, are the major storage site for calcium. Two hormones regulate this. You've got your parathyroid hormone and calcitonin. Parathyroid ho hormone is the major regulator of blood calcium. So if you have falling blood calcium, it's going to signal to the parathyroid to release parathyroid hormone. That parathyroid hormone signals your osteoclast to break down the matrix and let calcium into the blood. Calcium gets absorbed in the small intestines and uh, any reabsorption uh, of that CO2 um, can take it from uh, urine as well. Then you've got calcitonin, which if there is too much calcium in the blood, that triggers the thyroid to release the calcitonin. Calcitonin stimulates calcium salts to be deposited in the bone, um, so decreasing osteoclast activity. So here's that in sort of a picture form. What do we got going on? Uh, so you've got your bone that is storing calcium. Calcium in your blood is lowering. We need more. That's your parathyroid that is getting stimulated to release parathyroid hormone, which will then have osteoclast, break down bone matrix, release calcium. That calcium can be ingested um, in the small intestines. Anything that's unabsorbed is lost. Um, and of course, um, we can gain um, from filtering from the kidneys as well as lose extra calcium in urine. If our uh, calcium levels are um, too high, that's the calcitonin, which is going to then um, stop osteoclasts and allow the bones to lay down that calcium in its matrix. Okay, what happens to the skeletal system as we age? Well, with aging, we are going to lose bone matrix, and that bone matrix is going to become more brittle. We also have that cancellous bone loss, resulting in thinning and loss of trabeculae. Compact bone loss is really going to occur from the inside surface of bones because we're losing um, osteon formation. When you lose bone as you age, that increases the risk for fractures, can cause deformities, cause um, loss of height, shrinking. Um, there can be pain, there can be stiffness, they can lose your teeth. 
We have uh, osteopenia, which is where the bones become thinner and weaker with age. This is actually starting uh, between the ages of 30 and 40 years old. And so when you think of, you know, aging bone, you probably don't think of 30 and 40 year olds, but it's happening. Um, women are losing about 8% of their bone mass per decade, men about 3%. In the epiphysius, the vertebrae, and the jaws, that is where we are most affecting this. Um, and so we're resulting in fragile limbs, reducing height, and tooth loss. If osteopenia continues on, as it does, um, you get to osteoporosis, which is severe bone loss. Um, and it is going to start to affect the normal function of the bones. Um, over age 45 is when we start to see this. Uh, it's happening in about 29% of women and in about 18% of men. And here's what that is looking like. So um, you have your hip bone here. It's an x-ray version of it. Um, and you've got a break that has happened. If it were normal bone, here's what that trabeculae looks like. In an osteoporosis uh, bone, here's what that looks like. Much more brittle, weak, less of that matrix. So more susceptible to breakage, um, as well as, you know, the pain and reduced mobility that can come from this. Um, and then part of that genetic component we talked about earlier, but sort of in the same way of like disorders with bones, uh, dwarfism um, one type is this achondroplasia, which is a disorder of bone growth that prevents the cartilage in long bones and legs and arms from turning into bone. And so when we see this, you've got this uh, um, shorter stature, limited range of motion, a large head size, small fingers, normal intelligence. Um, and this actually, if you watch TLC, um, Little People Big World was a show that ho that they hosted a family that, you know, several of the family members had this, um, this uh, genetic disorder. And then this last picture, um, this just comes from your textbook as well as the online um, resources from McGraw-Hill. This is just sort of showing you um, that the skeletal system is an integral role in your body, obviously. It's holding on to all the other parts of your body. Um, and effects on the skeletal system can affect other systems. So, you know, your skin, that's transport. Um, and so, you know, weakening bones, um, any, anything wrong with bones is going to impact that. Same with the nervous system, et cetera. Um, any of their functions without, you know, healthy bones can be impacted. And in the same way, though, um, your other body systems affect bones, right? Like if your digestive system has errors in absorbing calcium, well, then that's going to affect bones or your parathyroid uh, in the endocrine system, that's going to impact bones. So really this graphic in your text and online um, in the resources is just showing you that it's, it's all interconnected, right? We're an organism made of organ systems. So while we talk about just bones here, um, it's important to know it's all connected. Great, so that is the end of our skeletal system stuff. Again, uh, your lab manual will help you as well as if you wanna look at some of the info in chapter eight on your own for help in the lab, um, that's there for you. There's lots of videos and resources and things on the D2L for you. Of course, if you have any questions or concerns, um, let me know. You can reach out to me during office hours, remind app, email. Um, but of course, you've got your homework assignment and your quiz on the D2L. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I hope that you have a great rest of your day.